Hello, this is Mike Sherwood Smith here speaking to you from Edinburgh in Scotland and um, I'm going to embark on another presentation in the series on the Modular Cognition Framework website and I'm going to talk about a general problem in cognitive science talking about uh, human knowledge and basically the human mind um, but I'm going to illustrate it using uh, research in multilingualism and it's uh, called the homunculus fallacy and the multilingual mind so let's get started first um, by way of a preface um, I have uh, just to make sure we know where we are standing I have an assumption and I have a question uh, my assumption uh, is about the mind and it's the following most of the mind's activities are subconscious. That is a pretty fair assumption nowadays. This is what uh, most people believe who are working in the general area of cognitive science, that most of the mind's activities are indeed subconscious. So we have uh, no um, access, as it were, to enormous, enormous amount of activity that's going all the, all the time, every millisecond of the day, as we solve various problems that don't require our attention. Uh, and there are cl many classic examples uh, like driving through a city, um, talking about something that really interests you with your passenger and discovering that you arrived safely at your destination, having weaved a w your way through countless uh, traffic lights and, uh, and obstacles um, without really being aware of what you're doing. That's a sort of classic example from psychology. But you get the idea. So, um, if it's true, um, and I'm assuming it is, that most, a vast amount of our uh, mind's activities are subconscious, um, then um, um, I have to, uh, to worry, I think, about uh, who is in charge in that area of my mind which is subconscious. After all, uh, we know very well when we make conscious decisions and very often we seem to follow these decisions through. Um, but um, if most of our mind is um, going on at a subconscious level, uh, there must be an enormous amount of decisions and options which are, are being activated, which require some kind of control, so complete chaos does not ensue. So that means my question is who or what regulates and directs that subconscious activity. So in other words, um, how do we avoid chaos? And indeed, the classic solution to this uh, is uh, the following. Uh, to make millions of those subconscious decisions and avoid complete chaos and confusion, we must have some kind of central processor or executive or supervisory control system. Implying, if you like, that there is some kind of central area in our subconscious mind which is helping to regulate everything and avoid the kind of chaos that could, in principle, uh, take place. Okay, so let's turn to the overview of this talk, um, starting with the important preliminaries. And the important preliminaries are the following. Um, firstly, I'm going to say what I mean by knowledge, mind and brain, very quickly, so uh, w we know exactly where we're starting from. Um, and um, perhaps more importantly, even than that, I'm going to have to give you a fast-track overview of modular cognition framework architecture. This is because um, some of you, many of you, may be uh, more or less unfamiliar uh, with this particular approach to understanding um, how the mind is put together. Uh, then I'll go on to the main topic, which is introducing the homunculus, the mind within the mind, uh, the subconscious controller, if you like. And uh, then, of course, necessarily, I have to deal with consciousness as well. So conscious cognitive control, that's the decisions we make consciously, and what impact do they have on us, on our mind, and I'll come to some conclusions. But I'll also add some reflections, um, and that will have to do with uh, free will. So, okay, uh, the first preliminary was um, 
the question of knowledge and mind and brain. So let's just get that done. Um, there are two levels of explanation um, when we talk about knowledge. Knowledge, of course, is what cognition is all about. Um, and we can talk about it in terms of the mind or in terms of the physical brain. And it's very, very, very easy to run off to the physical brain because uh, it's, uh, it's there, it's, it's a physical reality. Uh, and, and there are many ways now of examining the activity inside the brain, and it's all very exciting. Um, but if we're going to the brain for quick, easy answers about how our mind works, uh, we'll be in a lot of trouble. So it's important to keep these two uh, levels of explanation uh, separate, uh, even though they need at some point to be related to one another. Um, if we look at the two, uh, if we look at the, mi uh, uh, the mind, like the brain, it can be described as a set of collaborating cognitive systems, subsystems if you like. So in other words we have specialised areas uh, which have a special function which is not shared with any other one um, and this will come, become very clear as we go on. Um, but these systems uh, will collaborate in some way in order for us to solve the enormous complexity of getting through uh, every millisecond of the day uh, um, without complete disaster. So um, unlike the brain, uh, cognitive systems in the mind can be described in a significantly simpler, but not simple I'm afraid, simpler terms and I'll illustrate this in a minute. Uh, if we describe equivalent neural systems in the physical brain uh, that's to say, if we look at neural traces of knowledge, neural signs of knowledge activity or knowledge-related activity, this requires a very different approach, naturally, because we're talking not only in terms of time, um, but in terms of space, physical space. So uh, we're talking about different locations in the brain. We have to employ um, our descriptive uh, talents to working out the pathways between these locations and, and the different units uh, that we're talking about and finally of course uh, the kind of operations in the brain uh, ha are very special and need to be described in a particular way which is not relevant to describing the mind. Here for example is a very simplified picture of the visual system in the brain, in the human brain. It is highly simplified but already it's, it's a bit complicated if we display it on the screen like this. And if you imagine dis displaying all the different systems in the brain on one screen, you can imagine it will be extraordinarily complicated. Whereas, take the systems in the mind, the visual system in the mind, as it were, you know, if you like, the software that runs the hardware, that's one way of looking at it, also people don't like um, uh, equating the brain with a digital computer, which of course it isn't. Um, the visual system in the mind can be described in relatively simple terms. Now this is the way uh, a, a system, a knowledge system in the mind is described in the modular cognition framework and as you see it looks very simple compared with what we had on the right side of the screen. Uh, it has a processor and it has a store and every single visual system, uh, every single system in the mind is going to be described using this basic architecture. So let's focus now on the mind and uh, put the physical brain at some distance uh, for the time being. Okay, uh, now turning to my second uh, important preliminary, and that is. Um, uh, the modular cognition framework architecture. I can't possibly give you all the details. There have been books written about it. Uh, there are four out at the moment and there are many articles and chapters uh, where you can describe it. And there are also, of course, uh, the YouTube presentations that you'll find on the modular cognition framework, which is a quick and easy way of getting into it. Uh, but here's anyway a fast track overview. So. Um, in summary, your mind consists of a set of subsystems and your knowledge then is stored, processed, 
in one or other of your functionally specialized systems. Okay, remember uh, there's a processor and a store in each case. This is the visual system, it's a visual processor and a visual store. And the important thing to understand is that the processor embodies the principles of human vision, uh, which are given, given to us. Uh, we have evolved it, uh, so we can take these as, uh, as provided in advance. So uh, in this way, um, uh, uh, these principles, however they may be explained and described by uh, scientists who specialize in visual cognition, that's not the job of the framework uh, to, to explain, but these particular principles uh, will make sure that w whatever we're describing, we're describing uh, human vision and not, for example, chimpanzee vision, cat vision or dog vision. So every system um, has, uh, has biologically provided principles. So let's now begin with the sensory perceptual systems. Uh, these are particularly important for our survival in the physical world. And um, let's assume for present purposes uh, five senses. That's fairly safe, I think. Uh, four of them you will recognize immediately as the uh, traditional senses. The fifth one you might expect would be touch, uh, but nowadays um, uh, cognitive scientists, uh, neuroscientists included, um, uh, talk about the somatosensory system. So this is regarded as not just touch, but it's a much more complex uh, sense involving um, temperature sensing, um, a, a notion of where your body is in space. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about it as body sensing. Okay, that's the somatosensory sensory system. And each of these systems um, uh, will produce a different kind of knowledge. It'll be uh, uh, following different principles. It'll be visual presentations, which follow visual principles of human vision. There'll be auditory ones, there'll be olfactory ones, um, smell and uh, taste ones, gustatory ones, and indeed, of course, somatic sensory ones. And uh, this produces uh, five different types of knowledge. Do you think you have a single type of knowledge? No, you don't. You have different types of knowledge. So each of these systems uh, has, as I said, its own organizing principles which are uh, which we have evolved as human beings and um, uh, these principles as I said are embodied in um, each processor now I'm going to leave the processors out of the diagrams that follow because I think it uh, complicates things unnecessarily so I'm going to ask you please to assume the processors um, I will only actually show the stores now. So uh, these different systems, um, here are the stores, right, um, making a kind of outer circle um, um, uh, and in the closest possible uh, uh, um, they are as close as possible to the external reality that we move around in and uh, raw sensations are coming in via these various uh, channels and they're being um, made into representations. But um, these uh, functionally specialized systems uh, are not hanging there in the void, all separated, of course, because I've sa already said the mind is a set of collaborating systems. These, they have to collaborate, they have to interact in some way, and they do this because uh, they have uh, interfaces, they have connections, what we call interfaces. And this enables, say, an auditory representation to be associated with a visual representation. Um, and um, once uh, an association is made in our minds between a particular representation uh, in one, from one system and a, and a particular representation in another, 
um, these uh, are coactivated. So uh, if you, I don't know, take an apple for example, if you have a sort of um, a visual image, sorry, well not so much an image as a representation, the image is the experience you have, um, if you have a visual representation of uh, an apple, uh, keeping things simple, um, this will have lots of other associations as well of course, it will have taste sensations, smell sensations, uh, and it may even have an auditory uh, sense of a, the crunch of an apple when you bite through it. Um, so whenever one of these representations is um, activated then it will co-activate the others and co-activation is a matter of degree they won't necessarily be all activated to the same degree but they will uh, be activated think of them flashing away um, so uh, but th there's a big um, cautionary statement here because so far we've just talked about the perceptual sensory systems the perceptual systems here forming this sort of outer ring uh, and uh, richly interconnected as you see uh, but whenever any of them is activated uh, we get um, an experience that has no meaning and no value because the representations themselves have no meaning and no value in themselves so uh, uh, for example um, the representation of apple uh, however it's uh, represented you know in visually or auditorily um, we have no idea what significance the apple has in our minds and we don't know what value it has. In other words, we don't know if it's poisonous, we don't know if it's a threat, whether it's attractive. Uh, this uh, has not yet been explained yet. And for this um, uh, w we need something else. So by themselves they are meaningless and valueless. Um, we need a deeper level of processing. So we need more cognitive systems. We can call them inner cognitive systems, since we've called these, you know, the outer ring. So these uh, are sort of inner or deeper cognitive systems. And I'm going to talk about just four of them, four of them, right? Uh, there are more, but I'm going to talk just about four of them. That's all I need to introduce the homunculus. Okay, so uh, homunculus. This is the mind within the mind that uh, some people believe um, that uh, must be there in order to make everything that's going on um, beyond our awareness um, uh, not fall into complete chaos. Uh, and to explain the homunculus illusion, because it is an illusion I believe, um, we have um, uh, uh, these four systems uh, uh, necessary uh, for, for this explanation. And uh, as I said before, I'm going to deal with examples from multilingualism. Now, um, just as we saw was uh, true of the uh, perceptual systems, um, uh, these inner systems also interact via interfaces. In fact, the interfaces range across all of the mind, including the outer ones. And two of these, it turns out, regularly act as hubs. Um, and this is where I have to explain that um, uh, we've been talking thus far of, say, one representation being associated with another one in another system and then thereafter being co-activated. In actual fact, what happens in the mind is that whole networks of associations are co-activated so what you get is a whole uh, as I say a whole network uh, and uh, of representations and these um, are called schemas I shall refer to them simply as schemas and these schemas we're going to look at some in, in a minute um, all of these are activated together um, and when they're activated together different ones um, uh, coping with different tasks on different occasions uh, we see that um, a vast number of them um, have connections which pass via uh, one or other or indeed both of these two systems and that's why uh, we are calling and we I say we because I'm uh, talking together with uh, as it were with John Truscott who is my uh, colleague um, on the modular cognition framework project um, uh, we uh, we regard these uh, as hubs 
but uh, importantly not as uh, controlling hubs like um, perhaps for example an airline will have a single hub where um, uh, where all their planes have to um, uh, go from or through um, but very often they might have uh, an organizing the, the central organizing the headquarters of the uh, uh, the the airline is probably going to be in one or other of these hubs. This is not the case with the hubs I'm talking about. So I could equally call them crossroads with no supervisory function. And to illustrate this, uh, here's the conceptual hub, which um, associates uh, meanings. Um, so any other system will can get a meaning and significance by being associated with the conceptual system and you see it has the possibility of reaching out to many other systems, six in all. Um, and uh, the other one was the affective hub. Now the affective, uh, the conceptual system, um, a lot of researchers have been reluctant to admit that there is somehow an, a, an uh, a central um, meaning system which is which is uh, independent uh, but there's um, more and more evidence coming in in neuroscience uh, that the brain um, and therefore we are going to assume the mind has um, an independent system for um, assigning meaning uh, for organizing meaning um, and you could call it conceptual or you can call it semantic it doesn't really matter we call it uh, conceptual. Uh, as the affective system, um, we may associate this with a more primitive part of the brain, uh, the traditional limbic system. And um, when you say affect or affective system, uh, people mainly associate this with the emotions, the basic emotions. Uh, but today I'm only going to talk about uh, two very important um, primitive uh, representations, namely value representations, which are present in, uh, we think, all re all representations created uh, within the affective system. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about positive and negative values, and uh, this allows us to uh, remember I said the uh, perceptual systems uh, ha produce representations which have no meaning and no value. Well, they get the value via the conceptual system and they get their, sorry, they get their meaning via the conceptual system and they get their value via the affective system. And you see, like the conceptual hub, the affective hub also can reach out and connect up to six different systems. So um, all these um, uh, schema of representations, which are being activated, these networks, uh, they will typically pass this way. So there are there they are together, the two hubs together, and we'll find that um, most of the ongoing internal responses to the to what's going on in general, uh, the mind is constantly processing everything, um, uh, what it hears gets from the external environment, but also things going on inside. Um, and this creates a sort of internal world, an internal context, and um, many of the associations that have been um, are created uh, and are activated in networks will, as it were, um, uh, run through these two hubs. And uh, yeah, this uh, poses a, a problem in a sense uh, if you want to kind of associate some aspect of uh, mental functioning, of cognitive functioning, with something in the brain, and the physical brain, um, uh, and you have a specific interest, uh, like, like you're interested in, you know, um, let's say a particular meaning experience, or a visual experience, or indeed you want to find out where syntax is in the brain, where grammar is in the brain. What you will do when you go to the brain and create tasks to, to try and light up uh, particular path so you can identify that part of the brain which is responsible for the cognitive um, system that you're interested in, what you'll actually find is what I call a hub effect. You'll find multiple locations and pathways will always light out, uh, light up. So you will have, you'll have to try to uh, work out which of all those things which are lit up in the brain um, um, 
constitute the the area that you're interested in and which are which of those other things are simply lit up because they are associated in a, in a network of activation. So uh, it makes life a bit complicated. So, um, and it is because the modular mind, uh, the mo the, we, we're talking about the modular cognition framework, modules, uh, people um, associate with something fixed and isolated, uh, but in actual fact the modular mind is massively interconnected and you saw that with all those um, as, um, interfaces uh, crisscrossing um, uh, uh, through the hubs um, so uh, that means um, the brain will always be activated all over the place. Uh, in this context I'd like to make a distinction between language processing and linguistic processing. When I say language processing I'm really talking about language as we normally understand it. So when you're processing language, uh, you're actually activating pretty much everything else in the brain at the same time. Um, and that's why uh, language is a very interesting uh, phenomenon when we're looking at um, uh, cognitive control. But that's another issue. We won't go into that uh, particular uh, question, especially the cognitive benefits and disadvantages of uh, multilingualism. Uh, that's uh, for another presentation. Um, but uh, language processing general, generally uh, involves uh, very large, uh, wide-ranging uh, schemas, networks of activation. Whereas linguistic systems um, are very limited. In fact, uh, there are only two of them uh, the way we see things, uh, John and I, because we follow the Jackendorf um, uh, approach, um, Ray Jackendorf. Um, prominent linguist and um, uh, there are many uh, in the area of generative linguistics who maintain the uh, classical uh, mainstream approach and say that there are only one there's only one system uh, right uh, and that's of course uh, your choice you can choose either what principles are uh, working are embodied in the relevant processes so let's take, uh, I'm talking about multilingualism of course, but let's just take a bilingual. Let's take a bilingual, uh, an English-German bilingual, right? Um, and let's take the meaning of town. You see, this is a conceptual representation in the conceptual system. And let's say uh, this is the one we're concentrated on. And um, we want to make a link between the sound and the meaning, a traditional um, uh, linguistics 101 course will try to define a language in particular ways and a popular one is to say it's a way of linking sounds and meaning. And um, in the mind it is indeed possible to make a direct link between sounds and meaning. So when you hear the, the sound, Stadt, uh, the, the meaning town will pop into your mind. Um, and uh, you might ask yourself, do you really need a linguistic system to explain all this? Well, of course you do, um, but this direct link, we should say, it is possible, um, uh, and it's not particularly human. So we find, uh, for example, uh, bonobos, uh, chimpanzees of various kinds, um, great apes, um, being able to communicate via sign language. In this case, it wouldn't be a sound, a start, it would be a, a visual sign and, and uh, acquiring quite a large vocabulary. Uh, Kanzi, the bonobo, is a particular good example of that. And uh, so um, uh, this doesn't distinguish um, human and animal language. In fact, if we call this a language, we do it in a rather informal way. And when I talk about language, I'm talking about uh, one where linguistic structure is used. And once linguistic structure uh, is associated with uh, with these two, um, you are able to create meanings of incredible complexity. You are in a you you have a quantum leap, if you like, in what you can do with sounds and meanings or signs and meanings. So I want to uh, just uh, look at the kind of um, little schema, a fragment of a schema, just the linguistic part, uh, mostly um, in the case of German, whereby the sound of Stadt um, will uh, will coactivate the meaning T 
town. So you hear the sound and suddenly in your head uh, the town meaning pops up. Okay, so uh, we're going to see how that connects up uh, linguistically and uh, we will talk uh, after that um, about uh, the English part of you because you have uh, your bilingual English German bilingual you have both uh, English and German uh, cohabiting in your mind uh, so um, and and uh, we know uh, that uh, um, if you have uh, more than one language um, both languages will be to a greater extent uh, to a smaller or greater extent um, coactive I'll come to that in a minute okay so um, um, this bilingual will also um, uh, it, it, um, associate town with this sound and going the other way which is quite possible if you want to, if you're uh, if you are a German bilingual and you want to formulate um, a, a message a linguistic message um, you want to s speak or write um, expressing the meaning town um, uh, you have two ways of doing it right. uh, but as I say um, uh, in bilingualism research uh, it's uh, largely taken for granted now I think I can say that um, or at least the, the, the mainstream view is that languages are co-activated so if you're talking for example in English um, with other people speaking English some of them may be bilingual some of them may be monolingual and you're happily conversing in English uh, however um, inappropriate or uh, uh, redundant um, German will be it will nevertheless be activated research shows that the, uh, the other languages activated so anything associated with uh, German will be activated at the same time and if they are co-activated uh, they naturally mean there is competition right they are competing effectively you have two options in your head as a, a bilingual um, and they are constantly competing with one another and competition of course means conflict so uh, let's take uh, uh, let's take German to start off with and build a schema. So what happens? Uh, we have an auditory level, um, a phonological level, a syntactic level and conceptual level. These are the four cognitive systems which will wor are working to, to, to create this um, little network, this little schema, right? And the first step um, is this is co-activated the phonological structure so the sound now suddenly becomes a, a something to do with human language because it acquires a particular speech structure an abstract speech structure that we call phonological and this in turn activates uh, because there's a there is a interface between the, these two systems it activates um, a syntactic uh, 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 um, structure composed of um, a representation which is a uh, gender this is the feminine gender and a noun because as you know as you may well know German is a grammatical gender language you can't have a noun without a gender uh, so this is activated uh, not the case in English of course and uh, to complete the, f the, 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 the at least a fragment of the schema which will be activated remember um, if we're talking about language uh, lots of other things will be activated but this is the particular linguistic part this thing in the middle and we've got a little schema there right uh, going over to English it's fairly easy to now to guess how that would work out uh, the sound town which is a sound just like um, knocking on the door or creaking or the sound of wind going through trees the auditory system makes no distinction between sounds that happen to be involved in language uh, and other sounds uh, in order for it to be um, uh, a, a, a word it has to acquire at the very least uh, a phonological structure a speech structure and that's uh, represented here and um, uh, it has to get a syntactic structure a note no gender uh, is necessary um, and we have here now the 
the schema for English. But they are, of course, they are all activated together, and as we said before, um, coactivation means conflict, it means options. So there you are. Bilingual has in their mind coactivated two options, and uh, in potentially that means nonsense will come out because uh, they may arbitrarily select uh, uh, one structure here and one structure there and one structure there. So uh, complete garbage will come out, a complete mixture of German and English, which will make no sense at all. We can't have that. Now consider, um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about cheese now, right? Cheese, I was 25 years in Holland, so cheese somehow has acquired a special importance. Um, um, so we'll have a, a, an example using uh, cheese. Now here uh, on your left you see the conceptual uh, structure, the conceptual representation cheese and it's um, flickering away. I can't show it flickering unfortunately in this system but you imagine it flickering away, buzzing away. It's active. It's active. What is going to be coactive when this particular uh, meaning has been activated right in our bilingual so to do this uh, in a kind of structured way let's first uh, display the stores of the four inner cognitive systems that we're interested in firstly the two which um, uh, represent the linguistic structure um, and that is uh, taken together it can be called the grammar the inner mental grammar the intuitive grammar uh, that we have in our heads um, and which we are not aware of uh, functioning away, working away when we're speaking or writing or understanding, listening or, and reading. Um, and then uh, we have the meaning uh, one, the meaning of that one that uh, functions also as a hub. Uh, here are the meanings are, this is where the, the cheese meaning will be. Uh, and uh, we have of course the effective uh, store which will provide a value uh, to anything it's associated with and uh, we have the two uh, outer systems, the two perceptual systems which we're interested in as regards language. One is the auditory one and the other one is the visual one. So there we have uh, six systems in all. Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So we've got the stores. Now let's add the representations that are coactivated with um, the concept of cheese. First we put in the uh, uh, the pairs, the German and English linguistic structures, there they are, um, uh, two phonological ones, two syntactic ones, um, and uh, going on to look at the conceptual ones. Here's the cheese one that we knew was there already, but also in the bilingual it will be associated with another concept uh, which will be English or German because these two concepts will be activated along with cheese um, um, uh, because we're, uh, we're talking about language and um, the word language because we're not talking about German sausages or English fish and chips we're talking about language so these at the very least these concepts will also be co-activated and together if you like you can think of them as a complex meaning representation so here they are, all co-active together. And in the auditory store, since our bilingual is uh, both able to uh, understand um, sounds like geyser uh, and sounds like cheese, uh, these will be co-activated. And um, if we look at the visual store, uh, apart from the uh, text, the way in which cheese and uh, uh, and Kesa are written. These are visual representations. This is the text, right? Uh, the, these are visual representations which have no associa association in themselves with language but become associated if they're joined up in a network. And here is the visual representation of cheese. I'm sorry, I just put in what looks like a humble piece of cheddar. Um, you may, uh, this may be very complicated. Each individual will have their own visual representations of cheese. This is just a simplified version. 
Um, excuse me for that, but simplicity here is rather important. Okay, so um, we've got our stores, um, the relevant stores, uh, and we've got the various active representations which are all being activated together um, and we're going to expect uh, schemas uh, to link up all these associations in the way I've just mentioned. Right here uh, portrayed in another way is just the same thing I showed earlier on. This is the co-activated word schema for Kesa. Notice um, it's not one unit, uh, uh, the word Kesa it involves at least um, uh, at least uh, uh, four systems and four types of representation uh, and Kaiser, uh, the sound Kaiser has now become a word, a linguistic unit. Uh, we saw that earlier, that's just uh, reproducing in a different form what we saw earlier. Likewise the English one, uh, linking, uh, linking the sound cheese with the meaning cheese via uh, those two systems that provide it with linguistic structure. And if we go over to the, the conceptual associations, remember we, we saw there were four, minimally four activated. Uh, here is the schema linking everything up. So what you're seeing is a network of associations which are activated, uh, um, uh, joining these various co-activated representations for cheese. So lots are going on in your mind, and this is just a little bit of it. And um, you know, at the very least, um, there will be um, a positive value associated with English because you remember the kind of situation I was giving you is uh, an English German bilingual actually using English, uh, talking English to English speakers, um, listening to what they say in English in a totally English environment. Um, using English. At the same time, of course, their German is being activated, but um, uh, English has acquired a value because of the general context. Uh, it is important, right? Um, and so there is a, a positive currently, at this particular moment in time, there is a positive value associated with English as opposed to German. And German, uh, therefore, is uh, less valued. Uh, you may say it has a, uh, um, a negative evaluation, or you may say it simply has uh, no particular value at the same time. It doesn't really matter. Uh, there are various ways of representing this. And this brings us uh, on to the notion of dominance. Dominance is important uh, in the study of multilingualism because uh, people are said to have a dominant language. Very often it means the ones they're most proficient in. But I'm not talking about dominance in that general averaged out sense. I'm talking about a dominant in a current particular sense, in a current schema, in a particular moment. And as we saw, uh, however a proficient this English-German bilingual is uh, in either of these two languages, the currently dominant language will be uh, English um, and we can translate dominance into terms of relative levels of activation which essentially means that the network the schema for 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 English um, is more highly activated than the other one which is co-activated but a lower level of activation that's what it effectively means how does this happen well it is a peculiar fact um, that um, uh, the affective system has this ability uh, to, to boost the activation level of anything which it happens to be associated with. So an increase in the activation level of a value uh, will be transmitted to other representations in the schema, effectively boosting everything that is associated with it. And here you see portrayed the English schema that I showed you earlier and you see how the uh, effective uh, representation to which uh, the schema is attached via English is actually transmitted out and it means the whole schema is activated. And that's because um, English happens to be highly valued at the time. And why is it highly valued at the time? Because the overall way the mind is processing the situation 
has created um, uh, a high value for English. Uh, by contrast, uh, the weaker German schema, which is activated at the same time, is nevertheless not activated to the same level, uh, and it has well either a minus or a neutral value. So it seems th that we don't need um, some kind of central processor organizing everything in our subconscious mind. It seems that it happens to fall out from the general processing our mind does of the context in general. So what replaces this homunculus? Well, like the brain, the mind can be described as a set of collaborating cognitive systems. I said that earlier. This is exactly the same slide, except we didn't have this nice arrow. And the arrow says, no, the homunculus term, be careful, right? So we said it was collaborating. You said that the systems collaborate, but why is that a homunculus term? It's a homunculus term because it imputes a sort of um, cognitive decision-making character to the subconscious mind. The, uh, the cognitive systems, of course, do not know they're collaborating. And um, uh, certainly through uh, uh, psychology and psycholinguistics, for example, it's very common to have terms like um, uh, uh, predict, uh, select, decide. These things are used. And um, strictly speaking, they're metaphors. And if you tackle a researcher and pin them down and say, do you really mean you know that the mind is selecting this they might say well I guess it is or they might well say and that they would be right to do so this is just a handy way of saying this is a metaphorical way I don't mean it any in any literal sense okay so I'm going to change collaborating into a more neutral term I'm going to say the mind is a set of interacting cognitive systems Okay, well, remember the linguistic schema thing where these two uh, schema were clashing, you know, and this is just the linguistic structural part. Right, Bec there's, a, there's a problem because you have then two uh, are fighting it out here. Uh, one of them has to be chosen if you're going to, to maintain your English in this uh, situation I just mentioned, if you're going to go on talking English and not mix it up suddenly with lots of German coming in randomly in arbitrary ways, making you totally inarticulate. Um, if there is no subconscious supervisory system, what by default decides the outcome of any competition? What decides which of these are chosen? I've already said it, really. Um, the answer is the internal context. What's going on uh, in the mind's processing of uh, everything at the same time, which I call, uh, we call the internal context. Um, and so there are various ongoing changes. I'll give you an example in a minute, right? So currently um, English happens to be valued because uh, it is valued not because any decision has been made by the subconscious mind, it just has acquired a value from the processing of uh, the, the situation, the context in general. So, uh, when, and when I say internal context, and, uh, I mean here, everything, the extension, as it were, of these um, mini networks, these mini schema, out to involve all the other associations. So these external associations will determine which of the active linguistic schemas will ultimately win the competition. Um, so where there is no attempt at conscious intervention, and we'll set that aside for the next point, um, all the subconscious so-called selections, so-called predictions, they are all simply triggered via the hubs by whatever happens to be the internal context, whatever happens uh, in general in the mind's processing in general. It, they sort of fall out. Okay, so uh, that was is the default situation. What then might conscious decision making play? Make play? Very often uh, when we talk about cognitive control in the literature, uh, consciousness is involved. So what you need to know about um, conscious processing is the following. Um, I think there's a, a general consensus building now in cognitive science and neuroscience 
that uh, conscious processing involves very high levels of activation uh, and this activation is synchronized so you get lots of things firing all, all over the place. Um, these very high levels are synchronized and they're very resource intensive. In physical terms they use up a lot of calories, in psychological terms uh, they can often be felt as effortful. Effortful, you know, if you do a lot of it uh, it can um, get tiring. Um, and uh, um, uh, Stanislas Dahana, in uh, his uh, uh, neuroscientist, talks about um, um, uh, an igni a process of ignition. When conscious processing starts off, you see in the brain a kind of point in which everything ignites all over. So it's a general sort of highly active, um, active, uh, highly high level activation all over the brain. Okay, so in simple terms, when you're experiencing a delay, when you're retrieving a world, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the word? You can do this in, obviously, just one language, monolinguals can do, have this, what's the word? Well, I can't remember. If you're experiencing a delay, something which you expect is going to be happening straightforwardly without you even thinking about it, if there's a delay uh, in comprehending something or formulating a message, uh, this, this will trigger uh, conscious awareness is a problem, you know, we have a problem, as it were, and and what you get is this ignition, this very strong boost in activation levels across the mind and the brain. And in these circumstances, since we're talking about the mind, um, what happens is a metagol, a conscious metagol is, uh, is formulated or activated, since it's, it may already be there. Uh, a metagol um, in our rec recent book um, uh, John Triscott and I talk a lot about uh, goals, uh, the, uh, of which there are three. But anyway, uh, uh, a meta goal is a conscious goal that you formulate consciously um, in order to focus on a particular target. Right? You have a problem, you need to focus on something to solve it. For example, switch to L2, switch to my second language, switch to German, switch to English, whatever it happens to be, or um, uh, it can be all sorts of things uh, and um, uh, for example you find yourself in the, in the wrong language uh, let's think of a situation where you might suddenly um, uh, experience a, a problem and you find yourself in the wrong lang uh, speaking the wrong language you will formulate a meta goal consciously this time um, and, uh, uh, and, and for example when you uh, let's say you are thinking in English or talking in English to a friend and you're about to walk into a room where where German is is being spoken and you can hear German being spoken and you'll suddenly think oh a problem um, I have to switch to German now so you formulate a goal consciously to switch to German And the effective aim of this is to trigger a subconscious re-evaluation of the current non-dominant language, right? So you can have this thing switch to German, uh, but it, it won't automatically happen uh, because your subconscious mind has to cooperate, right? So what you're trying to do is to trigger some conscious, subconscious re-evaluation. You remember the affective system, the value system, assigning a higher value to one thing rather than another, you have to try and, and make your mind change the value system. Change the value, uh, the current value that is. But note two things, two important things. If, for example, um, you didn't hear German sounds coming through the, the door, since you were talking um, or thinking in English by yourself, merrily walking through the door, and suddenly you find yourself amidst people speaking German. This could trigger uh, the switch anyway, right? Without a metagol being activated, you might suddenly find yourself automatically uh, speaking German without actually having made any conscious decision to do so. And the second point is when a metagol, what I've called a metagol, is, is activated, you can't be 100% sure <laughs> that a change in the internal context, the way we described it earlier, hadn't already triggered 
a subconscious re-evaluation of which language was important. And it may happen to be just a couple of milliseconds beforehand, but you may already uh, have been reacting subconsciously uh, to the change uh, uh, before you actually dealt with the problem consciously. Uh, and there is a bit of, uh, there's some literature um, in the research, uh, there is some research literature to indicate that sometimes conscious decisions actually follow decisions already made subconsciously. Uh, the term, the word, uh, the, sorry, the researcher, libet is the one to look for, L-I-B-E-T. Okay, um, here's just a point in passing. Um, note that um, if you're a psycholinguistic researcher, uh, if you're a researcher in any area of psychology, in fact, uh, we're trying to elicit um, some uh, subconscious uh, uh, decisions or, or, if you like, some subconscious uh, behaviour in, uh, and you're going to perform a test um, and your aim is uh, not to reveal what the aim of the test is but to get your subjects to, to reveal it for you, nevertheless you'll be giving them instructions. So you will always be triggering conscious processing in your participants, whatever your interest is. And the intended effect of this, of course, is to to trigger in the minds of your participants certain metacols which you have to keep in mind as they do the test because you want them you know to test to for example press the left button when they see this or the right button when they see that so uh, they are very consciously active when they're doing your test which is probably aimed at looking at something subconscious of which they are not aware whether or not that's uh, conscious processing is having a, any effect on the task in hand of course is something you have to work out it may or may not have an effect okay moving now on to conclusions and reflections so uh, uh, what explains away that homunculus uh, well uh, the mind seems to behave in such a way as to suggest uh, suggest a, a single supervisory system making decisions making predictions resolving conflict creating stability avoiding chaos that's what it seems to be doing but in actual fact all uh, subconscious so-called decisions or predictions or whatever are in fact blind responses to the ongoing processing of the internal context uh, which triggers shifts in how options are valued uh, without any decision or regulation having to take place. So when we turn to consciousness we do have some sense of helping to control things and making our own decisions. I hope we do. But at the same time, as I pointed out earlier, even conscious decisions may also be influenced strongly by subconscious processes of which we cannot be aware. And this comes up in studies of uh, subconscious bias, for example, when you're voting for a particular candidate uh, or choosing a particular food. So there's a lot going on in your subconscious uh, of which you may not be aware and which um, may indeed impact on the conscious decisions you make. And, you know, thinking about this um, naturally uh, brings up the subject of free will, so I thought I'd have a little philosophical reflection and it is uh, just that and no more uh, about the problem of free will. Um, think back to uh, the cheesecake example. Uh, so there you walk into a, a, a shop and there is a delicious cheesecake. You absolutely love cheesecakes. It looks so delicious. You have a strong feeling of wanting to eat it. But you have already decided to go on a diet and uh, you have a, um, another idea in your head which is do not eat this cheesecake um, I'm on a diet idiot you may address yourself in an angry kind of manner uh, because you are faced with uh, incredible temptation and uh, you want at the same time to maintain your diet uh, and not give in so th in this case the immediate reward seems to have a much higher value 
than your diet plan uh, and you have an imbalance there uh, the conflict is not equal uh, it's very much stacked on the side of the immediate reward so the question is uh, to what extent can we consciously and effectively overrule the subconscious dominant option to what extent can we consciously and effectively overrule that dominant option which is uh, uh, which is triggered by the desire for immediate reward and we can only do that by a sort of indirect man manipulation of the internal context by initiating a meta goal as it were and hoping that our conscious uh, mind can somehow influence what goes on naturally at a subconscious level so the question is how able are we to consciously change that internal context to think ourselves into a new internal context as it were and indirectly nudge the balance away from what is otherwise simply going to win over is going to win you're going to grab that cheesecake whatever okay so this really is a question of uh, whether you have free will here are you committed uh, to give way to the immediate reward or can you in fact somehow by formulating a meta goal mentally create a an alternative context uh, which is sufficient for your subconscious mind to react and increase the value of the diet over the immediate reward and if you can and it seems on occasions that we can uh, we the human race the human species uh, would have evolved a limited form of free will and that really is how to explain it in terms of the modular cognition framework and that brings me to the end thank you very much I hope you enjoyed it.